Hey, welcome to Basil's next show. This is episode 13. That's 13. That's one and a three. That's a 10 plus three. And we have Scott Brick here, which is a lucky sign for us. You know, some people think that the number 13 is an unlucky number. but We don't think that the number 13 has anything to do with luck. We think what has to do with luck is whether or not we're involved and what kind of people are involved with us. And today with Scott Brick, we are indeed lucky. Now, that said, did you ever notice, brothers, how there's no houses here in Anchorage, Alaska that are built out of brick? Matter of fact, I don't think there's any houses in the entire state of Alaska that's built out of brick. I wonder why that is. Well, I think that has something to do with the uh, earthquakes and stuff like that and the bricks cracking open, falling apart. I don't believe that that is necessarily the complete truth. Oh, really, Charles the Troll, what do you think would be the reason that there's no houses built with brick here? Well, it all stems back to a particular event with one of my cousins, my cousin named Rodney the Red, and his particular affinity for eating bricks. But it is a long story. Oh, well, maybe we should get to that after the show's over then, and you could tell us all what happens uh, with your cousin Rodney and the red bricks. I would be willing to do that. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Scott Brick, coming to you from a place that is not here, but most likely has at least some brick houses. Enjoy the show. Well, here we are, well, ladies and gentlemen, with the with prolific the, narrator, Scott Brick, Scott Brick, down in down sunny in Southern sunny California. California. Sunny SoCal, it's a gorgeous day. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I can see I, by the sunshine shining in there. We've got a lot of sunshine up here in Alaska today, oh, but the temperature is probably not close to where you're at. So, What's, uh, what's the temperature up there right now? Let's see. Th- uh, 40 degrees, Ooh, according okay. to my cellular tower. Well, I don't want to... Brag, uh, we're about double that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I had a feeling. Last time I was down there, I was in San Diego for a, a, a thing for my day job, and uh, it was September. And September here is full autumn. The ground is oh. already frozen. The tr- the leaves are down. Sure. And so I brought light shirts down there, a couple of long sleeve you know things for uh, for the nighttime, and it was about eighty degrees. And yeah. I was walking all around the gas the gaslight district down there yeah sweating profusely happened to stop in every other bar to cool off i'd say the uh uh san diego comic-con is right there in the gaslight district Mm. and uh you know that's usually july or august and so it's brutal but uh it's a good problem to have i guess oh yeah oh yeah i should have remembered it i did my basic training in the military down there in san diego oh of course yeah right outside yeah the mcrd there which but I forgot. That was that was a long time ago. <laughs> so, at any rate, uh, we are here to talk about audiobooks and and this industry that we so enjoy. Um, and I'm curious. I mean, you've got a lot of stuff out there. You're probably as far as uh, audiobook narrator training material, information, website stuff. You've had a lot going on. You're you're a busy guy. And uh, how did you get started in this industry? Well, I tell you, I um, <clears throat> the, the way I got started, which is typically how it works in, in a lot of different industries, um, I I got help through a friend, and so I think that's actually the reason why I'm so <clears throat> excuse me. It's probably the reason why I'm so active in in teaching and trying to give uh, newcomers a a hand up because uh, one was offered to me um, years ago when I was at UCLA. We had a group of buddies, and when we uh, all finished school, we stayed in touch, and we would play baseball every Saturday. Mm. And uh, a friend of ours, uh, one of those friends, uh, Bob Westall, God bless that man, he uh, he was working for Dove Audio at the time. Mm. And Dove isn't around anymore, but it, they had just made a big splash with uh, the book about um, the O.J. murders. I, I want to say it was uh, Nicole Brown Simpson's best friend, Faye Resnick, I think, had written it. Huge, some tell all about their relationship, and um, Dove had just made a huge splash in the audiobook world, or at least that was their biggest hit. And I got in pretty much right after that, 
Mm. Uh, very different industry. It was, you know, you didn't really need a demo. You just, I, I knew Bob. Bob worked for them, and he, and he asked, uh, he asked his boss, Stefan Rudnicki, who's mm. a very prolific narrator. Oh, yeah. One of my sure. favorite voices. Absolutely. God bless that man. He, uh, he was working at Dove at the time, and mm. he, he said to Bob, I think he did him a favor, and said, okay, fine, send him in. And uh, I went in and read for him, and he gave me my first job. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Excellent. And nice. when was that? So that was like early 90s? It was June of 1999, June 10th, as a matter of fact. I wrote it down in my, uh, in my calendar, so I, I celebrate that anniversary every year. Now, what did you do before narration? Because obviously you didn't graduate high school in 1999, so... <laughs> No. Yeah, and I, I got a few gray hairs, probably, to <laughs> say the light of that. But um, when I got out of school, I was a professional Shakespearean actor for about mm. 10 years. Did um, uh, about 10 or 12 shows in rep. We toured all over California. Mm. I did that. Of course, I had a day job for many years. Um, and I finally, when I quit my day job, I became a full-time writer. Um mm. I was writing for the comic book press about various science fiction and comic book uh, toy projects. Right, right. Uh, Wizard Magazine, which isn't around anymore, but that's where I started working. And I wrote, I think, 300 articles in about three years. Wow. I got really burned out. And right as I was looking to make a change, uh, two things came along. I started uh, screenwriting. I got my first paid screenwriting gig. And then I got uh, my first big bestseller in audiobooks right at the same time. Oh, wow. Um, the timing was uh, uh, unfortunate, but, you know, it, 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 uh, I had to do basically both of these two huge projects. Oh, you froze. Are you there? Okay. <laughs> There, I'm here. Hold on, let me let me hit start my video. Hold on. Okay. Okay. So, and, and this this happens from time to time, by the way. That that cut of course. out. And Hold on a second. Okay. Our uh, our dog has uh, fibrosis, and she. Hacks and hacks and hacks, and she's just right outside the door, so I figured I'd close it just mm. so it doesn't bleed through. Oh, understandable. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, unfortunate circumstance, the two uh, happening at the same time there. Yeah, I got, um, I got a phone call from Books on Tape, which is now essentially Random House Audio, um, although Random House didn't own them at the time. They had received a call from Time Warner Audio, which is now Hachette Audio, uh, a lot of corporate restructuring, um, <laughs> and they had a book by Nelson DeMille. It was called The Lion's Game, and I they wanted to listen to that. Uh, it's one of my favorite books of all time. Yeah. Uh, people remember it very fondly, as do I. It's one of my favorite experiences in the studio, and mm. I was just starting out, and they had offered it to me, but they said, we've got a crazy tight deadline. Can you do this in two weeks? Mm. And I said, sure, absolutely. I can, uh, you know. So I think we started the next day. I got four days into this project when um, Morgan Freeman's uh, production company came calling. I'd known them and worked for them just as a consultant over the years mm -hmm. on uh, various science fiction projects that they were working on. Um, <laughs> I felt like, well, I'm a science fiction technical advisor. <laughs> you know, very, very highfalutin. Um, they suddenly asked me if I could uh, uh, rewrite this script for them, a feature, a feature film that they were developing. Mm. But they did it in two weeks. Oh, and geez. Well, okay, sure. And so I said yes, even though I'd already said yes to the Lions game. Mm. And assuming that they would understand and let me pick up the Lions game two weeks later. But I was brand new to the industry and didn't really understand how deadlines work in publishing and they said you know and they said uh, uh, they were very very nice about it they said look I know it's a huge opportunity for you but we only took this job from Time Warner because you said you could 
And I suddenly realized, well, I've got nobody to blame but my parents for giving me a sense of ethics. So uh, <laughs> um, I said, okay, and I rearranged my schedule. So I, I recorded every day from 7 a.m., which for anybody who knows me, that's about five hours before I like to wake up. Um, 7 a.m. until noon, I would record, and then I would go home, and I would write from 1 p.m. until about 2 a.m. Oh, wow. And I did that for 11 straight days, and I finished both projects on the same day. Oh, Crazy. man. That, that, that's where the dead in deadline comes in. That, that kind of <laughs> schedule can kill you. Yeah, they, they will make you dead if you keep uh, working like that. But to be honest, I think it's the best thing I ever did because um, it, it was my first screenwriting gig, and I was able to finish it, and that started me off there. But in this industry that I love so much, I, I could easily have never been hired again. You know? mm -hmm. This was early in my career, and I'm sure they would have hired me, but they wouldn't have had the confidence in me. Right. That, yes, they could hand me a bestseller or, or a small title, whatever it was, whatever the stature of the project, they knew that I would at least hit my deadline. And right. that's important in this industry. So. Yeah. I think that's something that a lot of new narrators, especially with all the home studio ACX type people coming in, really need to get a handle. If you want to you want to do this for a living, you got to work at that kind of pace, that kind of schedule, and be consistent. Absolutely, because, you know, a book comes along, and, and nowadays authors can make changes up until the last moment. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Tom Clancy, before he passed away, he, uh, he had the power to make the script changes a matter of weeks before the book went out. Yes, yeah. that's brutal for us because we're ideally recording about three months ahead of time if you know if we've got that much leeway. Right. So to be able to for them to be able to know that okay, you've got two weeks to get this done, and there's no two ways about it, and it means working a lot more hours in the day and working through your weekends and eleven or twelve days in a row in order to get it done without a break. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that uh, it can press on you. Now you do a lot of coaching as well. I do. And uh, what uh, describe what process you take uh, a new narrator through? Well, new narrators, a lot of them are uh, sometimes they're left wondering, do I have to read the whole book, or just certain characters? You know, um, you walk into the basics. Yes, you're reading the whole thing from go to woe, um, and I basically, with a brand new narrator, I'll cover the basics. I say, let's work on character. Let's work on, on character voices for your, for your dialogue, and I'll grab a, uh, I'll grab a two-person scene, man or a, a man and a woman, um, because that's what the publishers want to hear. That's mm -hmm. when a publisher listens to your demo, they're kicking the tires, and that's the tire they need to kick. How do you differentiate? <laughs> Now I'm I'm a I'm a very subtle guy when it comes to voices. I don't do character voices like Jim Dale. Uh, we're probably at opposite ends of the spectrum. So what I usually do with a student is I say, "This is how little you can do to make the characters different. Let's start there. Let's start with how little you need to do, right? And find where you're comfortable. You can you can go further if you want, but this I, I, as long as they're that they can get that, that they don't have to work really, really hard, that it's not animation and it's not video games. It's very, very subtle. I say, let's start it there and then get as big as, as you want to be. Mm. Um, so I do that with dialogue, uh, with, with uh, narrative. I, I spend a long time with them on narrative, and I'll find sections that have no dialogue whatsoever. I want them to just immerse themselves in the idea of telling a story without an exterior monologue. It's all interior. It's all right. description. Um, a lot of people tend to rush through these long sections. Narrators will rush through so they can get to the dialogue so they can act. My belief is it's the opposite. The, the real acting comes from how you're able to handle narrative. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, without, being, without droning and getting boring. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, it gets especially difficult when it's a when the narrator of the book, the the, the narrator that the author has chosen to use, when it's a first person narrator, 
Mm-hmm. And that's, you have to go from first-person narrative, which is essentially one extended 11-hour monologue, to uh, from first-person narrative to that same character in dialogue. How do you make that sound different? Right, right. So we just, we, we I keep just went through that in a, uh, a whole series of six books that were all first-person from the same character for wasn't 11 hours it was like uh, like 77 hours yeah yeah it, that got hard <laughs> yeah it's uh it's it's the kind of skill you don't realize you're going to need until you need it yeah um yeah. And I, I remember the first time i had to do it and i felt like oh my god i felt uh, it was it was the deer in the headlights moment and uh, so, which is why I try to warn them ahead of time. You know, you're going to face this at some point, so let's right. let's do it now. So, um, so I start off that way with with newcomers, and then as their skill sets improve and they want to keep talking about more elaborate, more detailed um, issues that come up, great, we can do that. Um, I, I try to tailor it for the individual. Narrator. I had a guy in my class the other day. He'd done 125 books. Mm. I was like, "What in the world are you doing here?" But he had very specific issues that he knew he was facing. So he said, "I would just, I just, I want to work through them." I said, Great. And that that brings me to my next question: What about training for experienced narrators? Someone with 50 plus books, 70 plus books. Well, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, make a disclaimer. I I'm a big fan of taking classes constantly. But I say that as a guy who teaches classes, and I don't want to make it sound like I'm trying to get a bunch of people to take my class. I don't care whether you study with me. There are a <laughs> lot of really great teachers out there. But study with somebody, because I think the worst problem that we can encounter in any, in any, uh, any kind of career is to believe that you know what you're doing. <laughs> I believe in confidence. I believe in the... In the uh, a confident knowledge that that you know uh, you know how to tell a story. I believe that takes you a long, long way in this industry. But when you start feeling as though you know all the tricks, you've done it all. <coughs> excuse me. That there's nothing left to learn. I mean, that's that is a huge, huge stumbling block. Mm. Um, I was ten or I want to say ten or eleven years into my career. I came across something in a book that I had never seen before. And I remember when I had been handed that book, it was, uh, I thought it was a very straightforward thriller. You know, a murder mystery, um, ex-cop takes down bad guys. You know, I thought, uh, I'm not going to have to work hard on this book. I've I've done a a, a hundred like this. Mm -hmm. I got to the end and I realized what the author was doing. It was extraordinary. It was so well written. He, um, he was writing the uh, as the bad guy was dying. He he kept writing in these small small chunks, very small sentences. One word, two words, and it was all his interior monologue in bullet points because his life was dwindling. It was it was like 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 uh, sands in a in an hourglass. It was it was it was falling out, and he only had a little bit left. And I realized that as this chapter was going further and further, and the character was getting closer and closer to death, the words kept getting, the sentences kept getting smaller and smaller. And I realized when we got to the last, his last paragraph, it said, I'm trying to remember, it said, um, that's it, no more, goodbye. And those were his last thoughts. Mm-hmm. And I suddenly went, that's it. Two one syllable words. No more. Same thing. Two one syllable words. The last sentence, goodbye. One two syllable words. Uh, one two syllable word. And I suddenly realized it's, he's thinking in, along the lines of uh, he's, he's, he's thinking harmonized with his heartbeat, that he feels pounding mm. in his ears and his blood is rushing out of him. And so I went back and I recorded that final scene over again, and I kept giving it this unconscious bum bum, bum bum, slowing it down until finally at the end, that's it, no more, good, bye. Mm. 
And I don't know that anybody listening to that book will ever think, oh, wow, that reminds me of a heartbeat. I, I'm, I'm hoping that it's subtle enough that people won't notice it. Um, but I remember when I finished the book realizing, huh, I thought I knew what I was doing. I'd done about 500 books at that point. I thought I really knew, but I can still be surprised. So that's why I'm a big fan of, of taking classes. About three years ago, I'd, I'd never taken an audiobook class. There, there were no audiobook classes when I was starting out. Um, I was completely self-taught, but um, Paul Rubin was coming to town. Uh, you know, fabulous New York producer, and I, I, living in New York, I never had the chance to work with him, and I thought, I want to know somebody else's approach. I want to know how they do it. I think the best reason that you can keep studying is to learn and avoid your bad habits. Mm. We've all got them. Yeah, 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 definitely. Do you now? Do you recommend that narrators listen to other people's audiobooks? Absolutely. I recommend that they listen, but that they also listen to as wide a variety as, as possible. I look at, at all audiobook narrators as being on a spectrum. Uh, starting from on one side with character voices like Jim Dale. On the other side, I mean, I'm not even going to talk about myself, uh, but I, I, I had somebody like David Warner on the other side, who's a magnificent narrator and yet never, never does voices. Mm. And uh, a number of friends of mine have worked with him, and he always reminds you of that. Whenever he sits down in the studio on the first day of a book, he always says, Hello, I'm David. I don't do voices. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, and yet, his storytelling is so evocative. It's a, it's mm. a wonderful, um, it's a how-to course in what you can achieve without doing character voices. Mm. So I looked at those two ends of the spectrum, Jim Dale and David Warner, and I think, find out where you are on that spectrum. I'm a lot closer to David Warner than I am to Jim Dale. So what I do is, okay, since I'm comfortable way over here, I listen to a lot of guys like Jim Dale. Because I may not do what they do very often, but I am going to be called to do it occasionally. Not very often. There's a handful of books that I've done in my career that right. really needed over-the-top character voices. And I hate doing them, but you know what? I, I'm called to do them occasionally, so I, I better damn well get comfortable with my you know, process. So I listen to them to find out how to do something that I have no knowledge of. So that I, that's what I mean by I encourage people to listen to somebody as different from themselves mm. as possible, just to learn what can be done. Right. And there's so many magic tricks that can be done with narration, like you said, with the heartbeat thing and, and things like that, that you know, just suck a person right into the... Absolutely. And I and again, I, I really don't think that 99% of the listeners are going to have any idea of what we're doing, hopefully, because um, Pat Fraley, who I, I teach classes with a lot, um, he's got a wonderful saying. He tells you to do something, but don't get caught. Mm. And that's a, it's a, it's a fine line. It really oh, yeah. is. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we can add subtleties like the heartbeat or whatever it is, and even if they never notice, we've still right. done the job. I, I think subtlety, especially in this industry, subtlety plays. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, so we've gone over training. Right now, do you do other... You, you mentioned before that you were a writer and that you were writing comic books. Uh, comic now, books. Were you doing the art for the I, comic books as well? No, I actually never wrote comic books themselves. I wrote oh. for... Comic book press. I was basically, ah. if you wanted to put a really good spin on it, I was a comic book reporter. Ooh, yeah, okay. if you you can call it that. So but, that's like that's like nerd boy heaven, dude. I'm telling you, <laughs> I, let, I let my freak flag fly. I mean, I uh, God, they sent me one time to go to Chicago to uh, do a day in the life of interview, and I'm like, yeah, great. Who lives in Chicago? Oh, Alex Ross, you're going to go spend the day with him. Mm. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I, was, I about lost my gourd. It came out of my gourd. It was amazing. Oh. Uh, it, was a, it was a very cool gig. I enjoyed it a lot. That sounds like a lot of fun. A lot yeah. of fun. And, you know, that's kind of like what this narrating thing is, is having fun doing your job. You know, ha having a job that's, a, that's your pleasure. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the very first time I, I ever did a, a Dune book, uh, I actually got to do two of them back to back. I did a, uh, a prequel, which is written by Frank Herbert's son, Brian, and uh, his writing partner, Kevin J. Anderson. Uh, the first one of their books I did was Dune the Butlerian Jihad. Mm. And there was all these terms that, you know, I wasn't going to make them up. I was, I was a huge Dune fan, and I didn't want to guess. So... Um, immediately after doing that book, we had we went back and we did the very first installment of Dune. And I said, "All right, I, I did my research. I, I went to the glossary and I I got this list. And there are in that first book, I think there were 498 words and phrases that never appear in the English language completely. Mm. Not. And so I got in touch with." You know, Frank Herbert, he, he passed away, of course, by this point. But his son, Brian, he starts sending me his dad's notes. Oh, yeah, my dad kept, like, copious notes about how these things should be pronounced. Huh. Here, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll fax them to you. And so, oh, my God, my fax machine, the old the thermal paper, the thermal paper, uh -huh. the roll. Oh, my God, these thermal paper faxes start coming out, and I'm seeing Frank Herbert's notes come out of my fax machine. Oh, wow. I, my God, I was dancing like a giddy school kid. It was amazing. So, yeah, that's what I love is, is the fact that I'm getting asked to do things professionally that I've been doing personally just for fun for decades. So, cool, cool gig. And now you get to make a living at it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> that is excellent. That is excellent. Where do you see uh, your own career, uh, say, 10 years from now? Uh, my own career? Yeah. Um, well, obviously, I want to keep doing books. Uh, um, there are a number of things that I work on all the time. That I'm the kind of guy that I get bored if I can only do one thing mm. at a time. So if it's been too long, I go back and I do a, a, a production on stage. If, I, if it's been too long, I go and I work on a film. If it's been too long, I go and I write... Uh, uh, I write a screenplay. I just finished my first novel, and it's oh wow, go out for sale in the next next couple of months. I'm doing a rewrite at the moment, but um, you know, I, I I kind of imagine ten years I'll be doing a lot of the same things. Just uh, kind of a jack of all trades in the industry. Yeah, jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> I just uh, you know, I think we have to follow our passion in life, and that sounds like a cliche, but. You know, I got sick a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and it made me reassess what's important in life. And I'll tell you, books have always been and will always be hugely important, and I'll never stop working on books. But there were a couple of other things that I hadn't been working on in a while that it made me realize, yeah, i got to pick that up again. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, ten years from now. Wrote, yeah. wrote about the, your issue on your website. A couple years yeah, ago, reading that. and uh, I figured you know at some point it's going to come out, and better people hear it from me than on Facebook. So right, right, out of myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good that you are through that and uh, getting yourself healthy and strong. You know, it, it, and it does change your perspective. You know, when yeah, it really does. Right. I mean, uh, suddenly faced with the prospect of not being able to talk anymore. Yeah, that was a big deal. Oh yeah. Okay. Throw the fear of God into you. Oh yeah, so. yeah. That uh, that's hard in this business. I had yeah a, a brush with blindness the other day during a an episode. I mean, it was intentional, but I didn't know it was going to affect me that way. At the eye oh. doctor, where they put the drops in and dilate your eyes, and and uh, suddenly, you know, I thought I was going to put out three finished hours that night, and uh, couldn't read a thing for about six hours. Yeah, I've had that happen. Oh, man, I don't want this to ever happen in real life. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. No, I have friends of mine who've gone blind. I have friends of mine who've lost their hearing, and mm -hmm. you don't realize what you have until it's almost gone, or God forbid, you know, past that when it actually is gone. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That and that's very true, especially when you're young. These are great yeah. perspectives we have when we're in our forties, fifties, sixties, and uh, but when you're in your twenties and thirties, you're invincible. So, oh, you're young and immortal, mm -hmm. of course, absolutely. And speaking of young immortals. My uh, my housemates would like to come up and ask you a question. They Please. proposed this to me uh, 
yesterday. So I thought, well, okay, we'll let you play. So, right. please, you want to come up now? Yes, Mr. Basil will come up now. Okay, brothers, come up here. Let's ask this question. And uh, this is Mr. Scott Brick. You remember him? Yeah, we listened to those books of his. Hello, Mr. Brick. My name is Feely, and I am the senior brother of the four brothers of the leprechauns that live in Basil's house. And um, we're, we're brothers, which means we're all related to each other. And uh, I being the eldest, and then Neely and Boffin and Berthold in order. Okay. And uh, so we've got this question, and uh, I shall ask it of you. And uh, we'll see where we go from here. Okay. And, uh, so, and this is a question that will very likely define you to generations for many, many decades beyond our own lives. And All right, get ready. This is for perpetuity. Okay, okay, here we go. You're driving down a country lane when a giant kangaroo named Berthold... Berthold? Hey, wait, that's my name. Why have I got to be a kangaroo? No, be quiet, Berthold. I'm telling the story. But I don't want to be a kangaroo. Berthold, it's just a story. You're driving down when you see a giant kangaroo named Berthold. He hops up to the side of your vehicle and motions for you to roll down the window. You do, and Berthold points to a large flying saucer hovering just above your vehicle. A pair of big-eyed aliens smiles down at you from a portal on the side, and Berthold says, They're looking for volunteers to go back with them. Shall I tell them you're going? What would you do, sir? I'll tell you what. Um, if these aliens have a bridge that looks like the one in the Starship Enterprise, and if I can sit in Kirk's chair, I'm in. Not a second thought. I am in. I am. I dive in feet first. Well, you know the bridge of the Enterprise was actually designed after the TARDIS was actually designed after an alien flying saucer, much like the one that Berthold is playing out there. So, oh, so it's there. And there's even an alien Uhura in there. Oh, oh. But she's uh, green. I, I'm fine with that. You really, really fine with that. I'm, yeah. Well, that's an excellent answer. Now, would you want to take your girlfriend with you? Oh, uh, y yes, absolutely. Uh, that would be that would be best. I I hope that um, uh, wherever we would go, it would be a vegan, gluten free planet, because uh, that way she and I would both be happy. Well, I am sure that there are some out there, although I don't want to go myself. We could find it where uh, things like uh, sugar and caffeine would be good for you. We could find it like that? Yeah, yeah. Sugar, caffeine, and whiskey. Those uh, things uh, would make it a good place for me. I think I like you guys. Well, thank you very much, sir. That was very informative. We will now go psychoanalyze that answer and uh, see if we can get to the true heart and soul of Mr. Scott Brick. Thank you very much. Okay, boys. Go back down to you. Finish what you were doing. Thank you, boss. We'll be back later. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, there we go. Um, any parting things you would like to say to the audience of narrators that would be listening to this interview? Uh, if you're a narrator listening to this interview, um, think about what you want to achieve in this industry, whether you've gotten uh, 10 jobs so far or 100 or 500. Um, my girlfriend actually has made me think along these lines uh, in, the, in the four years that we've been together. Um, sometimes we have a tendency to just roll along and just take whatever jobs come our way. But I think if you start challenging yourself to answer, you know, what do I want to do in this industry? Where do I want to be? As you asked, where do I want to be in five years, ten years? Um, it helps us not just to identify uh, our goals, but to achieve them. And when you have a clear idea of what you want, it's so much easier to go after it. So um, there's a number of things, uh, advice I always give narrators uh, when we're working in class. Um, be reading constantly. Know as much as you can about uh, about writing. Even if you're not a writer, read a book about writing, just so that you know why an author does what he or she does. If you know why they're doing something, you'll be able to help them do it even better. Um, and, you know, be as active as you can in the community um, with all of us, one another, but also as active as you can on social media. You know, have a web presence. Um, 
years ago when I was working for Time Warner, there's a producer there who doesn't work there anymore, but he told me, he said, uh, God, I hope you get famous. I said, Bill, that's nice to hear somebody else say. He said, no, uh, if, if you get, if you build a name for yourself, it'll be so easy to hire you. The, 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 the higher your profile, the higher our profile, mm -hmm. the books that we're putting out. And not every publisher gets that these days, but we need to keep that in mind always. Do what we can, help the authors, help the publishers. Um, work begets work. So, yeah. Excellent advice. A lot in a little bit of time. I just tried to squeeze all that in. Well, you did fine. And uh, I really appreciate the time that you've spent with us here. And uh, are you going to be at APAC? In yes, absolutely. Uh, heading out uh, a day early to do uh, uh, Johnny Heller's. That's right. You're in a, one of those, too. I'll be, I'll be there as well. Fabulous. Yeah, that's a long haul for you. How long a flight is that for you? It's, uh, <laughs> including layovers, it's about uh, 16 hours, I think. Because all the, flight, all, the, all the affordable flights out of Alaska... Uh, don't take off until after 6 p.m. And then right. we all we always land in Seattle to switch over and usually get there right at 11 when they close. So therefore you sit in the airport until 5, 6 in the morning and then finish the journey the next day. So 16 hours. About that. I, 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 could be, I could be in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's closer for me to go to Japan or Korea. Oh my God! A straight shot there is about the same as flying to California for me. You know what? But you're a good man for for being as active as you are in the community when you're as isolated as, uh, geographically as you are. Good for you for making the effort. Um, uh, if it wasn't for the social media, I would have never got into this. You know, if I just because you know I, I got into narrating because I was a writer and I narrated my own as a podcast because I didn't know if I was any good, so I just gave it away and. Uh, sure. Turned out, after a while, someone hired me, and the next thing you know, here I am, almost 70 books later, climbing the ladder. That's and fabulous. Time. And for every person out there who feels isolated by where they live, you know, mm -hmm. um, living in Iowa or Kentucky or Texas, I mean, wherever, wherever you are, if you feel like you're a world away from the publishing industry, you're not. They don't have to look any further than, than your case and see what you can do, <laughs> even when you're... Uh, when you are isolated, you, you plan ahead, you spend the money, you go to APAC, and you make the connections you need to make. Oh, that's a, that's a <laughs> thing. I'm really looking forward to it. A, I'm looking forward to meeting all you cool people. And uh, uh, B, it's going to be a great connection with people I haven't met yet. Well, it'll be great. It's always a fun time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Never been to New York City, so we'll see oh, if this country gosh. boy can survive it. Uh, I, I hope you enjoy it. It's, a, it's, it's fabulous. We'll see. All righty. Well, thank you very much, Scott. I look forward to meeting you in a few weeks down there. And, and As you are. All righty. Thanks for having me on. You bet. So, uh, Gerald there, Gerald the Troll, you were telling us about your cousin Rodney the Red, who is also, I would assume, a troll. And he he had something to do with the reason that there's no brick houses here in Anchorage, Alaska. Why, yes, as a matter of fact, there were at one point in time many brick houses here in Anchorage, Alaska, and I know that because we was here uh, back at the very beginning. And our cousin Rodney de Red, you know, most trolls are made of a greenish, brownish, greyish, and lichen-covered a rock-type substance that uh, encrusts the outer edges of our bodies. Yes, yes indeed, I have noticed that you blend in quite well with, uh, with the gravel and the lichens and so on. Yes, well, Rodney got his name as Rodney the Red because he really enjoyed the taste of the typical American red bricks uh, for his luncheon and his afternoon tea. He enjoyed eating red bricks. Well, what does that have to do with there not being houses made of red bricks here in Anchorage, Alaska? Well, that is quite simple. He had a rather rapacious appetite. So are you saying that he ate all of the red brick houses in Anchorage? Only a few. And then they put up some Rodney proof fences back in about late 1963. And, uh, well, you know, as they say, history uh, was made from that point. 
I, I don't understand what you're talking about. Uh, 1963, what did that have to do with it? Well, have you ever heard of the 1964 Good Friday earthquake? Oh, yes, 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 of course. That uh, That's the earthquake that destroyed a large part of uh, Anchorage, as well as Valdez and some other uh, small cities and some outlying islands. Yeah, it was a very, very tragic event there, yeah. Well... As it turns out, that event was set off by a temper tantrum by my cousin, uh, Rodney the Red. Why would that be? Well, they cut him off from eating bricks, what? Okay. And he threw a temper tantrum. Okay. Well, uh, have you ever seen a £3,000 troll throw a temper tantrum in a coastal city? Oh, I'm starting to get a picture here. Yeah, well, he jumped up and down a few times, and then he he beat his fist on the ground, and then next thing you know, well, if it was a story of a free piggies, that brick house wouldn't have lasted. Oh, so the reason that there's no brick houses here in Anchorage, Alaska, is because uh, your cousin Rodney the Red uh, stomped about a lot, and... Uh, yeah, he crushed him. I pretty much broke them all. And those that survived, he ate as a snack afterwards. Oh. Uh, is Rodney still around town here? No, actually, he went on and got an education and he became a barrister in uh, in Chicago. He became a barrister in Chicago? Right. He's a lawyer. Makes good money. Enough to buy enough bricks to eat, that is. Okay. Rodney! Okay. Well, Gerald, I'm sure you're working on getting our next guest lined up, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. The next guest is going to be Andy Aunt. And she's not made of bricks, so she doesn't have to worry about being eaten. I see. Matter of fact, she's quite a nice young lady. Uh, rather attractive, if you ask me, but that's just my opinion. So, uh... Goodbye, everyone. Have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. See you at APAC. And, uh, yeah. Okay, well, that does that for that. Uh, that explains a lot for us. Well, this show is copyright 2015 by Sandman Production Studios of Alaska and uh, Basil Sands. And, uh, and don't build your house out of bricks because even though the uh, wild wolf may huff and puff and try to blow your house down, it won't really matter if a troll named Rodney comes along and eats them all. And he's a lawyer, so he could back himself up legally with that too. Don't forget that part. Oh yeah, he's a barrister. Right, we're out of here, bye.